an empty animal enclosure at a zoo in England. As I play on the chimpanzee's climbing frame, I wonder, what would it be like to be an ape? Not a human ape, but a chimp, a gorilla, or an orangutan. I'm Susan Blackmore, a psychologist. I've spent my life studying the origins of the human mind and thinking about what distinguishes us from other animals. We are capable of conscious thought and applying our knowledge to solve difficult problems. Can our closest living relatives, the great apes, do the same? I am about to meet some of the cleverest apes in the world. A 19-year-old chimpanzee who can do things that would defeat a human child. A 26-stone orangutan who is a master of conversation. And a chimpanzee in Japan with an extraordinary head for numbers. This is my chance to meet some of the world's brainiest apes. My first port of call is in the United States. In a secure compound outside of Columbus, Ohio, I drive to my first encounter with a highly educated ape. The Primate Cognition Project at Ohio State University is one of the leading laboratories in the world devoted to the study of chimpanzee behavior. I've been told that one of the apes here is self-aware, understands words and numbers, and can solve difficult problems. Welcome to Ohio State University. Thanks. Doesn't look much like a university. It looks like kind of military establishment. It's really scary. Can't really believe there's chimps in there. I know it sounds strange, but I'm nervous. This is a bit like a blind date. Will the apes like me? How will we get on? Hello? Anybody there? Oh, hello. Hi. Is, is Sally Boyson here? Yes, yeah, she is. Let me grab her real fast. Thank you very much. There are 11 chimps here in Ohio. Most have been rescued from medical research or neglectful private owners. Sally Boyson is director of the project. <laughs> well, how wonderful to meet you with, with those two little ones. Who are they? Pardon? Who are they? Who are these two? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is this is Emma with a brand new Christmas outfit. Hello, See, Emma? Emma? Oh, 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 well, Emma. maybe not. <laughs> Emma, that's not very nice. We've got visitors. Got, Over 20 years, Look, Dr. Boyson has studied the social behavior of it's groups of chimpanzees, oh, their use of tools, and their numerical competence. That's so interesting, isn't it? Mm. Oh, little grooming sounds. Very nice, very nice. Does that mean he wants to groom me? That's what he was responding to, yeah, in your braid. Hey, can we groom me? Harper, would you like to put a new shirt on to be a little... No, I'm too busy. You know, Two baby chimps are her latest acquisitions. And everyone gets quite distressed when they see Harper, the little boy, in those frou-frou clothes. So... In the kitchen area, I'm introduced to the principal subjects of Dr. Boyson's research. There are three adult females. Hello. Sarah wants your attention, Hello. please. Well, she's looking right at... What on earth do you think she's thinking about me? She's, uh, she's probably um, thinking about... Your hair color, which is unusual to her. <laughs> yeah. Are you being rude about no. me? She'd also like to smell your finger. <laughs> Am I allowed? Will it touch your foot? This is so different from seeing animals in a zoo. Okay. The chimps here seem as interested in me as I am in them. Oh, she sees your fingernail polish. See? Yeah. Is that interesting? You can just to put her. it up against the glass for her She's to look at. She's really interested, isn't she? Yeah. 
But why are all the experimental subjects girls? Is there something wrong with the boys? Hi, guys. We're Hi. coming out here. It's OK. Oh, we have a visitor. Let's come along here, Sue, and I want to introduce you to the males. Now, wow. here's the first one to meet. This is Kermit. Uh, Kermit's, Kermit's stressed. That's why upset. he's yeah. agitated. This is Bobby. Hey, Bob. How are you? And here comes Daryl. Hi, Daryl. Kermit and Daryl. What would they do? do? I don't like to think about it, but what would they do to me if I went in there? Oh, if you went in there, oh. They'd, they tell me to they'd, bits? Well, no, but they'd stomp on you a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh stop. well, I joined the club. I've got oh, spat on. No, that wasn't very nice. <laughs> he came shooting at me. Did it? When your back was turned. <laughs> I got <laughs> spat on. Just a little I'm all wet. Just a little one. <laughs> <laughs> I've been torn from a cozy kitchen with girls admiring nail polish to a cage full of powerful males impressing each other with fearsome displays. This is a different kind of intelligence. Social, hierarchical, and deadly serious. Come out here, it's gonna be so much fun. Finally, the purpose of my trip to Ohio, Sheba, the subject of numerous academic papers and one of the cleverest apes Sally has ever worked with. For my safety, she works behind reinforced perspex. All right. Oh, my goodness. Isn't this thing so exciting? Oh, it's so exciting. Oh, I know you're happy. She's got a new group. Sheba is 19 years old. She was born in captivity, raised in a zoo, and moved in with Sally at the age of four. We have devised a series of experiments to explore Sheba's intelligence. The first, does she have self-awareness? Does she have a sense of I, Sheba, a living, thinking animal? I'm longing to see how she reacts to a series of experiments with a mirror. Hey, do you want to do some work? Do you want to do some work? Oh, good. Most animals, when they look in a mirror, behave as though there were just a second creature behind the glass. Well, she looks to me like someone who knows that herself, and she's looking up her nose. Oh, What's in your nose? You're saying if your nose is clean, Sheba. Look, she's picking at her... It's, it's, it's obvious she knows that's herself in there. She's not behaving towards that as though it's another chimp. What? Let's see. Well, come here, we're going to sit here and do something, OK? This is a classic so test that's right been right done with many animals, where you put a little spot on them and see whether they try to get it off in the mirror. So there's a spot on her head. The idea is, imagine that I put a spot on your forehead when you weren't, paying, you know, like when you were asleep, and you woke up in the morning and you looked in the mirror and you're, ugh, you'd, you know, you'd go, what's that, wouldn't you? Because you know it's you and you know the spot's there. If you thought it was some other person in the, in the, in the, in the mirror, you, you know, they got a spot on. So the question is, here we go, she's putting a spot on. Brilliant, she's playing with her all the time, so Sheba wouldn't have felt her put the spot on at all. Now, what will she do? When she looks in the mirror, will she Can see that spot and know it's her? OK, there you go. Who is that? Straight oh, to it. There was a spot. There's a sheep. <laughs> Where did that come from? She knows that's herself Where in the mirror. Where did that come from? <laughs> Fantastic. Sheba successfully demonstrates a skill that what? human children only acquire at about the age of 18 what? months. By the time we're adults, we see more than just a reflection in a mirror. Mm. We care how we look to others. Want to try it? Does Sheba care? Okay, look at yourself. Can she imagine how other people will see her? Does she have what scientists call a theory of mind? A bit of fun with some lipstick may give us a clue. Look at yourself in the mirror. Sheba, don't bite it. Oh, icky. She's eating it. <laughs> okay, put some lipstick on. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. It's quite oh, difficult to see what she's doing. She's, is she is putting it on. Look. Is she looking in the mirror to see herself put it? Yes. Yes, you clever girl. Is that pretty? Let's see. Let's see. She's putting it on now. She's putting it on her lips and making them all red. I wonder what she's thinking. Now, what do you think she's thinking? Do you think, she's, do you think she thinks it's pretty? Yeah. Oh, Sheba, that's lovely. Turn this way so we can see you. Turn this way. Like that, yeah, so they can see your pretty face. Look, I have another kind, too. This is even redder. Sheba takes a break. She has demonstrated some sense of self, but I need to take care. 
Because chimps look so much like us, it's all too easy to imagine that they must think and feel like us. She's enthusiastic going into her room there. Come Look at on. that. All right. You do enjoy it, Sheba, don't you? Next up, a test of Sheba's understanding of space. We humans use plans and maps to find our way around. A tiny map can represent a whole city. Can Sheba understand a similar relationship? Yeah, and look at this. And here's a little tire. See the little tire here? And here's the climbing structure. I suppose she's showing her the different objects and talking about them. You see this little tiny thing? Little tiny thing. Sally places a tiny object in a scaled down model of the room. Can Sheba find the real object in the real room? Where is it, Chief? You're quick as a flash. Oh, there it is. Yay. She has no trouble Good with job. that. That's brilliant. Good job. Would you get a treat? A treat. She, she must Yummy. be doing that just like I would. You know, she sees it and it's yeah, obvious to her. She just goes and does it. Wow. Excellent. Excellent job. Yeah, that was good. Good job. Well done, Sheba. Very nice work. Are you showing off to us, Sheba? Now we need a couple of minutes while she eats her treat. It looks to me as though it's obvious to her that that, that little model there is the same thing as the big room there. So she can just do it. That shows that she has in her head a three-dimensional picture oh, yeah. that she can use to find things. Scale up, change in, change in size, change in orientation, all that changing is going on in her head. Can you sit back a little bit? Sit back a little bit. Sit right here. You'd expect an animal that lives in the forest and zooms up trees all the time to have a very good grasp of three-dimensional relationships. But to be able to relate that to a tiny model, that's clever, that's additional. And I didn't expect to see her being able to do that so easily. And she just did it. It's in this, in this thing. No, this thing. Yeah, see? Watch. Bye-bye. Humans can't do this until the age of three. I wonder, can Sheba do this a second time? Oh, and she look in the climbing frame. Is she looking? Yes, she's going into the climbing frame. Yeah, she's looking through oh, the window. There <laughs> she's is. got it. She Come can do over. that, that task. That's good. not difficult that for good. her. How does it relate to us? You know, we, we think we're the clever, we're the clever, yeah. cleverest uh, animals on the planet. But here we're seeing them do all sorts of intelligent things. What, what, how do you feel about that relationship between our kind of clever and their kind of clever? Well, I, there's a limit to how far they can go, obviously. Um, but th some of the basics that we see in young children, we can see in the chimps as well. Do you think it's like they are very much like human babies up to the point when humans start talking and then they stop? Or are they, are they different? Do they have different kinds of intelligence? Well, I think that, yes, they have different kinds of intelligence because obviously they do quite well with tremendous demands on them in the wild yeah. to survive. Which we couldn't do. <laughs> uh, uh, no I couldn't, you know. I've never tried that rubbing the sticks together business. But, um, yeah, so they have a full repertoire of dealing with a very complex social organization. That takes a lot of brain power mm. to do that and keep all the relationships in place, similar to the kinds of things we do. An historic distinction between man and beast okay, has been our ability to resist temptation. Okay. Humans don't just live in the present, but can hold back for the sake of a future reward. Are you ready for another turn? Okay, which one are you gonna pick? In a new oh, experiment, okay. Sally yeah, shows Sheba yeah. two bowls of sweets. Sheba points to one of them. Good Instead of getting those sweets, they're put back in the box. So Sheba has to point to the bowl with the fewer sweets in order to get the most. Some over here, which one you pick? These? Okay. Oh, that was good, Sheep. Her success shows a remarkable capacity for self-control. Okay, which one you gonna pick? Yeah. Down the corridor, the baby chimps have a new friend, the son of the project manager. Playing with them both, I'm struck by a big difference between the human and the chimp. Max looks straight into my eyes and we imitate each other's facial expressions. Harper, for all his lively play, is always looking somewhere else. Yes, isn't it fun? I am impressed by what I've seen here in Ohio. My search for the cleverest ape in the world is beginning to reveal some of the qualities of the ape mind. 
Sheba demonstrated all sorts of skills that some people argue are unique to humans. Responding to Sally's commands, she obviously understands some words. Turn the light back on. Sheba, turn it on. Turn it on. But is she capable of true language? I don't know. But I am about to meet an ape who's been learning sign language all of his life. A species dating back 20 million years, he looks nothing like me. But when I speak to him, he'll answer me back. Atlanta, Georgia, to see Chantek, an orangutan, and one of the cleverest apes in the world. Perhaps the main claim to human uniqueness is that we alone can create a vast and complex culture based upon language. Not only do we know the meanings of words, but we can combine them in novel combinations so as to communicate complex ideas. Sheba seems to have understood some words. But does this show that apes other than humans are capable of language too? I'm off to the zoo in Atlanta to meet an ape who might tell me. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling Chantek dear. Mommy loves you, Daddy loves you, Lenny loves you, Chantek dear. On a freezing cold morning, I'm invited round the back of the ape enclosure at the zoo to meet a vast male orangutan with a nine-foot arm span. Since the age of nine months, Chantek has been taught to use and understand sign language by anthropologist Dr. Lynn Miles. Who's this? Hello, Who's Chantek. This? Do you have a sign name? Yes, I do. It's um, Red Hair. Oh, Chantek, that's Red Hair. Red Hair, look. <laughs> he doesn't want to look at red hair. <laughs> Kind of funky red hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Chantek, Chantek, would you please throw me the bottle and I'll give you. Ah. Uh, well. <laughs> Will he throw? Chantek, yeah. Chantek, guess, guess where it went. It went down in the moat. Do you want banana? You think about it. You think which you want to do. Part of, I guess, Working with him over these 20 years is always respecting him and what he wants. He and doesn't have to come and play, does no, he? No, no, it's up to him. You want banana? Do you want me to look? Banana, all right. Just a minute. Chantek was born in captivity at a primate research center in Atlanta. Lynn was a researcher working on an animal intelligence project at the University of Tennessee. In 1978, Lynn became Chantek's foster parent. In her research, Lynn sought to explore the language abilities of orangutans. If an ape could speak, would it reveal a mind? And what sort of mind would it be? The problem was that, like all great apes, Chantek's vocal tract simply couldn't make human speech sounds. Lynn had to teach Chantek to use American Sign Language. Twenty-three years on, Lynn and Chantek can communicate in impressive ways. Soon after my arrival, they play a popular children's game. We're going to play Simon Says, OK? You ready? Simon says, 
Touch your chest. Good. Simon says, stomp your foot. Good. Simon says, clap your hands. Chantek, Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, touch under your arms. Simon says, finished. Good. Very good. Chantek shows all of the basic skills needed to play the game. He can take turns, understand the structure of the game, and it looks as though he can translate the actions of others into actions of his own. But imitation is very difficult for most animals. Would he imitate me, a stranger? Simon says... Good! <laughs> very good! Simon says... Uh-uh, you lost. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> Ch Thank you, Chantek. Good, good. One more. Sue. Simon says. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Chantek. Thank you, Chantek. To do something like that and to see him, you know, I just thought I'll do that and to see him do it straight back like that was, well, it was quite something. I was quite, um, <sighs> Do you want hot chocolate or the water? Yeah. Humans understand words before chocolate. they can talk. They comprehend single words after 12 months and simple sentences at the age of two. I'm curious to know how Chantek matches up. To what extent does he truly comprehend conversation? Okay, I have to put it in the bottle there, in the cup. Do you have the cap? Could you put, could you put the cap on? It is absolutely extraordinary to me to see you having such an intelligent conversation and he's going and getting it. He doesn't use his hands but his mouth to complete the delicate task. Has he understood that you can only throw him the hot chocolate with a cap on? Try. You must have, must I, Good. Very good. Brilliant. You deserve the hot chocolate, Chantek. What an encounter. I'm full of questions about the nature of this ape-human communication. It's obvious in your relationship with Chantek that he's a real person to you. What kind of a person is he? Well, I like to think of Chantek as the first orangutan person. He is obviously an adult now, and so he has a great sense of himself. And I got that very clearly. Human children aren't taught language. They just absorb it from the conversations around them. From a very young age, Chantek had to be coached. I began to associate his food and his baby bottle with the signs for food and drink. I would also mold his hands. I would take his hands and make them in that shape and then bring them to his lips. Today, Chantek knows over 150 signs. Signs for objects, actions, colors, drinks, and food. A brush of his finger means banana. A touch of the mouth, apple. Has he made up words? Chantek has made up several. He's made up a word um, for balloon. He goes like this. And he's made up a sign for Viewmaster, that little device where you see yeah, slides. slides yeah. And he's made up a sign called Dave Missing Finger for a favorite worker who had an injury. And Chantek was always fascinated with his hands. You can ask Chantek some questions. You can say to him, what do you want? OK, let's try that. What? What? Your index finger. Oh, sorry. What do you want? Very good. Or what? Do you want? Is the facial expression important? But George, she's got it. <laughs> Atlanta, day two. What distinguishes true language from mere association is using different word orders to mean different things. From the age of two, humans put words together to make new meanings. Today, I hope to find out whether Chantek can do the same 
by signing to yes. him myself. Chantek, Sue asked, can she give you banana? Yes, it's right here. There's apple and banana for you. Which apple? Here you are. Here comes apple. <laughs> Perfect cat. OK, in the, in the next second. I take care to put together several signs to make a sentence. Will Chantek give a full reply? Which, Which do, do you want? OK. Which you want? He's saying, Chantek, Chantek. Apple and banana. Throw apple, banana. Which do you want? Uh, which, which? 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 Apple. Apple. Oh, no. Apple. He's saying apple and, and banana. I know. You're not having both, Chantek. What's this? Apple. <laughs> There's no doubt that Chantek knows the signs for different foods, but I've seen no evidence of him Oops. making up sentences or using words for anything other than naming things. Chantek, Sue is giving you food now. You want banana? You want banana? Does he ever say thank you? On rare occasions. <laughs> but, right. What, what, Chantek? He, he just, I think he just signed. He just signed part of Sue. He signed um, um, red hair. Yes. Red hair give you banana. Uh, red hair? Give you banana. He wants both, he's telling you. You can only have one. By asking for me, Chantek may have been initiating a dialogue, something children do at about the age of three or four. I'm not going to force him to talk anymore. I'd rather give him something concrete to do. Lynn says that he enjoys doing puzzles. You can do the puzzle, all right? Look right here. It's got an apple. Good shot. For the first time, Chantek's female companions, Saibu and Biji, take an interest in what he's doing. Oh, he's, he's doing it. Chantek completes a piece of the puzzle. He's done one. Ah, oh, good. Let's put one in. Good, you did one. Very good. Bee Gees got some pieces. See, he did one. Can we see? Can we look? Will you show me the puzzle? Please? Can I see? That's right. Okay, now turn it around. Turn the puzzle around. That's right. Good boy. Thank you. Yes. <gasps> good. Good. <laughs> yes, you did a good job. Good work. Okay, now put the puzzle in the blanket. Tie it, please. Chantek needs to get the puzzle back to Lynn and me on the other side of the moat. Good. Now put the puzzle in the blanket. Put it, put it on the blanket. His solution to a tricky problem gives a surprising insight yeah, into his understanding of language. Chantek Sue says put the puzzle in the blanket. Can you do that? Put it in the blanket. The puzzle in the blanket. Yes. Good boy. Good. Very good. Yes. Now, oh, yes. You're going to get a big apple. <laughs> now, maybe throw. This the is extraordinary. 
Chantek wasn't just naming the objects puzzle and blanket, but he could understand different relationships between them, on and in. You'd see the same degree of comprehension in a three-year-old human. Very good. I'm proud of you. I love you. I think he is an extremely intelligent animal. I think his main strength lies in tool use and understanding the mechanical um, affordances, it's called. I can't, I can't think of a simpler word, you know, what you can do with objects. Um, he seems to me very clever about that and inventive, which is a sign of intelligence. I think he uses the signs quite naturally, but he's always downgrading them. He's always doing the, the least sign he can get away with. You know, he's not showing um, enthusiasm for elaborating his language. But a really interesting thing happened. When I had to go, I, I sort of, I said to him, um, um, you meet friends? And he immediately went like this. And I was really quite touched. And I said, I said to Lynn, um, oh, that's really nice. I, you know, I must say, I really, I really do like him and I'm really glad I met him. So she said to him with, you know, signs I couldn't do, Sue really likes you. And he went, <laughs> I thought, oh. <laughs> now, who knows what's going on there, but, you know, I felt sort of touched and pleased. Yeah, it was a real communication there. And, you know, that's, that's intelligent and that's very interesting. I'll be sad to leave Chantek. It's not every day that I get the chance to talk to an ape. But what he can do is nothing compared to the chimpanzee I will soon meet in Japan. over an Asian skyline, an adult male chimpanzee declares his superiority. of my journey in search of some of the cleverest apes in the world takes me to Inuyama in Japan and the work of Professor Tetsuru Matsusawa. Over more than 20 years, Matsuzawa and his Primate Studies Institute have established a group of chimpanzees. They live together in an outdoor enclosure where they've established the kind of hierarchies that chimpanzees have in the wild. Before lunch, the males get excited and put on particularly impressive displays. <laughs> Away from the fray, a chimpanzee called Ai and her eight-month-old baby, Ayumu. Ai has worked with Professor Matsusawa for 23 years. She was born in West Africa and brought to the Institute as a baby. Since then, she has learned to read Japanese characters, use numbers and show off her skills with a computer. At 8.30 every morning, I is called inside to work in a state-of-the-art laboratory. Ayumu is always with her. I plays a vital role in research on our evolutionary roots. Where did humans come from? Why are our minds the way they are? By establishing what a chimpanzee can or can't do, Matsuzawa hopes to understand the uniqueness, or not, of the human mind. 
scientist and ape work on experiments for hour upon hour in a glass tank. Aye. Aye. I'm told to sit down and not interrupt. Hello, I. Hello. At last, Hello. in a scheduled break, Hello. I'm granted a chance to meet I. She's surprisingly direct. What a proud mummy you must be. You have a beautiful baby. Yes, you do. Hello. 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 You like to be kissed. I'll kiss her then. She's a kind of teacher's pet. Yes. <laughs> a girl who loved to read the books. Yes. Could you characterize what her particular clever skill is? I mean, in, in children, for example, patience. there are always patience. Yes. yes. <laughs> now, teachers <laughs> like patience, don't patience. they? <laughs> but I think such a kind of patience or concentration is coming from her strong curiosity. Yes. She's curious. She really wants she to really know. She really wants to know mm. what's going on. So that kind of curiosity is very special. I think it's very rare to find. What interests me is Ai's skill in understanding numbers. Here she is. Since the age of five, I has been learning to count in much the same way as children in nursery school. When she was young, she was shown anything from one to nine objects, say six pencils, and then taught to point at the corresponding number on a touch sensitive screen. She then learned to put the numbers naught to nine in the right order. In this experiment, numbers are shown in a random sequence on a computer screen. Her task is to touch them in ascending order. She's not only getting them right, but she's doing them very fast. As the experiment progresses, more and more numbers are generated at random on the screen. I gets 90 sequences correct out of 100. But how is she doing this? Does she choose the first number, then look for the next one, and so on up the sequence? Or does she commit the whole picture to memory at the start and then touch them all from her remembered image? Matsuzawa has devised an ingenious way to find out. In a new experiment, as soon as I touches the first number, white squares cover all the rest. Now she only has memory to go on. How many numbers can she remember? It seems she can even get the sequence right with five numbers. I has an impressive memory. She gets almost every number sequence correct and hits the first number in less than a second. What's the significance to the chimpanzees in the wild? Why would they need this kind of short-term memory? Suppose that you, the chimpanzee, are facing to opposing group of chimpanzees. The enemy. Now you, enemy. You have to count the number of enemy, and you have to remember um, a group of your enemies there, and how many, and then you shift your attention to the other direction to find the other group of enemies there, and you also have to remind you of the situation of your friends, how far they are, and how many can be expected to rush to help you. Yeah. 
through a passageway deep underground, Matsusawa takes me to an observation room in the chimp's enclosure. Now it's our turn to be inside a glass box. This is Akira, the father of Ai's baby, displaying his superiority to strangers. I <laughs> is giving me a new respect for the chimpanzee mind. When I started my journey, I had no idea of what it's like to be a chimp. Matsusawa's research shows that with a powerful working memory, chimps must be able to hold several ideas in their head at once, just like me. I think not many people have believed that humans and the other animals are so close. Not many people have been convincing that humans are the product of evolution. So through the study of chimpanzees, because they are the closest relative for us, we are really convincing that humans are not a special separate species, but we share the common ancestors in the past, and we share lots of traits, even in the field of intelligence. We share many things with chimpanzees. Throughout my journey, I have wanted to directly compare the intelligence of apes and humans, but haven't had the chance. I asked Matsusawa if he would invite a group of schoolchildren to his lab to try the same numerical experiment as I, the chimpanzee. No, he said, he wanted a bigger challenge. I, Dr. Susan Blackmore, 50-year-old psychology lecturer and Oxford graduate, should sit the test instead. You need to get a bit more comfortable with it. Because of this drain, it's a bit tricky here. OK. I'm, I'm not very comfortable. I need to work this out better. Because it's not fair to test me against I if she's comfortable and I'm not. Snap it. Will it? Yes. OK, then. I think, I'll, I think I'd rather have... Can I have something like um, coat. a coat or something just sure. to sit on the floor? I'm not used to sitting on this. It's a towel, right? Yeah, just the bigger the better, really. If there's anything bigger, is there anything? Okay. Big okay. drum roll. Oh, I'm ready for this test. <laughs> so let's start. Okay. Here we go. That's quite a lot of numbers. I'm less confident about this. <gasps> Ooh, oh, I made a mistake. I shouldn't talk at the same time. I should concentrate. Perhaps I should try in the whole hand. No, that doesn't help. Ah! <laughs> I lost it, that one. I really didn't remember them at all. <gasps> I wasn't paying attention. I realised as I went for that one that I really didn't know what number it was. I knew that was a guess. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've lost confidence now. I'm a failure. Oh. It begins to dawn on me that I'm not just making a lot of mistakes, but I'm going terribly slowly. The test is almost over. 
with four numbers, I could do the task, but with five, I failed. <laughs> I has now beaten you, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to... I'm more interested in the pattern. Because I just think I can't do five. I think I'll... You know, I can't yeah. take you five all at once, and I wonder... We have... Wondered how so I get the holiday in the south. Gets Goodbye. the, ho gets the free holiday. Get the the I, the chimpanzee, correctly remembered twice as many five-number sequences as me, and got the correct answers in half the time. Having done this, uh, this test and having seen I do the test, does it reveal anything to you about I's intelligence? surprising that, that the results should compare so closely? Well, I don't know whether I'm surprised. I think I've lost a grip on what I should be surprised by anymore. I, no, I think I'm not surprised. Surprise. To be surprised, you need to have a prior expectation. And I think I didn't. I think I'm just learning so much about chimpanzee minds <laughs> rather than being surprised. In the peace and serenity of a hot tub back at my Japanese hotel, I reflect upon my journey. I have travelled 11,000 miles and met some of the cleverest apes in the world. Shiba has shown me that chimpanzees have a sense of self and that it's not only humans who can use abstract models to find their way around the world. Unlike many humans, she can also resist temptation. Chantek was charming. Somehow, he touched my heart. Perhaps because, for the first time in my life, another animal returned my conversation. But I fear that I was reading more into his signs than was really there. Human children can use and manipulate language to much greater effect. In I, the chimpanzee, I, the human, have met my match. Her short-term visual memory was twice as acute as mine. I has shown me that in certain tasks, chimps are actually smarter than us.